while there's not many times that being British gets me into trouble, uh, usually it's getting me out because I speak nicely and people think, oh, God bless him, he's from that other country, we can't get that one time. But uh, there is one time I remember that it got me into a lot of trouble. Uh, I was on vacation with my family and we were out on water park day. We'd come over to the US uh, because all the best water parks are in America. So we were actually in San Antonio in Texas going to a place called Schlitterbahn. If you have never heard of that, it's one of the largest water parks in the US. And as always happens when you go somewhere like this, the lines are out of control. They're way too big. There's thousands of people in ride for one slide. Uh, and we find a spot where it looks like it's the back of the line. So we go over and we kind of get ourselves in, in, in the spot and start thinking, okay, how are we going to pass the next hour until we have that 30 seconds of joy going down the slide. Um, and as we do so, uh, a lady approaches us from behind. And uh, she, at first, it seems very friendly. She just says, hey, have you guys, uh, you guys been in line here long? Uh, and so we're sat and we say, oh, no, not, not too long. My sister replies in what I call her overly polite British voice because she, she's very introverted. And so when anyone at all talks to her in public, she gets very British, very polite. She says, no, not for too long. Uh, and then all, all of a sudden, this woman's face completely changes as though we have committed a heinous crime. And you can tell that what she's about to say is not going to be pleasant, uh, but she attacks us at the very heart of being British. She says, don't try and be polite with me. Just because you're from not around here doesn't mean you can just get in line wherever you feel. And it turns out that we had accidentally come into the middle of the line. Now, to this day, I remember this event because I'm, I hold on to things way too long. And I distinctly remember that there was, there was a huge gap, that there was no one else at the back of this line. And I thought this was the back of the line. And then she had the audacity to challenge British people, who, may I say, are the best line makers in the entire world. <laughs> she challenged us on not even knowing where the back of the line was. Well, I held on that for a long time. And I remember thinking, just as a young kid, I was about 10 or 11, I, th I was thinking, what an injustice that she would accuse us of this. And we didn't, we didn't even do it. We're not even guilty of it. And then as you grow up, you continue to feel these little injustices, right? Someone pulls in the parking spot that you had dreamed of. You saw it first. You approached it like a sensible driver and someone else snags it in front of you. And you think, oh, the injustice of it. And what do you do when you face injustice, right? Because unfortunately, those things, as amusing as the art was, those are not what real injustice is. It would be nice if the worst things that happen to human beings is that we cut one another off in lines or in parking spaces. But the truth is, we live in a world that is flooded with unimaginable injustice. And in fact, I start with stories like that because if I were to tell you a story this morning of real injustice, it would be something that a lot of us wouldn't know what to do with at the start of the sermon. How do we move on from it? Because it wounds us. There's not one of us alive that when we hear the stories of someone who is being falsely accused, someone who is being oppressed, someone who is being harmed, that our hearts don't ache about that. And that's what we're talking about this morning as we continue to talk about the Psalms. We're going to look at a Psalm of Lament that looks at the problem of injustice. Last week, together as a church, Pastor Jason Cusick led us through a Psalm of Lament and talked about more of a personal lament. How we in our lives as we face sadness and brokenness, depression, anxiety, and pain of that sort, we lament and we cry out to God. And this week we look more as we kind of lament corporately about the brokenness in our entire world. And we read a psalm of David, Psalm 10, in which David goes on this explanation of his call out to God in the midst of great injustice. And here's what Psalm 10 primarily reminds us. Here's what this morning is all about reminding us in this place. Is that in the face of great injustice, God has not forgotten the afflicted. And neither should we. In the face of great injustice, our God has not forgotten those who are afflicted. And neither should we. Now Psalm 10 was, as I said, written most likely by David. Here's how we know this, because if you read it in your Bible, it doesn't really say an author at the top of it. But if we went back to something called the Septuagint, which was one of the first earliest translations of the Old Testament uh, into the language of Greek, which is what Jesus would have written it in, or read it in, uh, we'd see that Psalm 9 and 10 were actually one psalm. 
So if you go into your Bibles and you read Psalm 9, which is said to be authored right there at the front by David, a Psalm of David, originally Psalm 9 and 10 were one Psalm together. And one of the other reasons we know this is if we could read it in Hebrew, we would see that there's an acrostic, that every stanza, every verse of those two Psalms begin with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So there's a lot of evidence that suggests these two were originally together, written by David. And what David writes about in this Psalm is the problem of injustice, about these injustices that he faces in his life. It seems that he's going through a period of really great trial, pain, burden, perhaps during one of the times that he's on the run from one of his many enemies, because David's life was full of injustice. He was on many occasions falsely accused, had to run for his life, abandon his home, had to travel with a few friends that believed him. And what does David say in this moment? It's strange, isn't it? Because we might imagine a great Bible character like David, that the first words out of his mouth is, but I know that this is not going to last. I know that you are with me, God. Because you're the God that was with me with Goliath in the valley. You're the God who was there with me throughout the time in the fields as a shepherd boy. But here's what David says. He doesn't say immediately, God, I know that this will all be okay. God, at the beginning of this psalm, he says, why, O Lord, do you stand far away? And so we get in this, the question of what we should do in the face of injustice, because David doesn't necessarily react, at least immediately, how we might anticipate him to. And what he does is he gives us three ways in which we can face injustice together as the people of God. The first thing he tells us is to cry out to God. Next, to cling to our faith. And lastly, to continue to work for justice. So we're going to look at those three things and how they pop out in this psalm together. And the first of which is that he calls us to cry out to God. David calls us to cry out to our God. Now, as many of you know, I have three children, two young boys who are four and two, and now a newborn Annie who's now six months. Uh, And all three of my kids, as many young kids do, know how to call out to dad or mom, right, in the middle of the night. And Recently, we uh, have been dealing with a little bit higher volume of calls in the night than usual, Uh, and there's all manner of things that we get called in there for. Uh, I remember one of the ones recently, there was a thunderstorm, and Jonathan called me into his room, he's shouting uh, in the middle of the night, dad, dad, daddy, dad, dad, daddy, 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 dad, dad, dad. (laughs) So I come into the room, and we talk, I said, it's okay, it's just a thunderstorm, don't worry about it. Uh, and as we get in there and I'm talking him through this, he says, I, I think I know what this is, Dad. I think this, that the Flash and Thor are having a race. And that's what all the flashes of lightning are and all everything like that. At this point, I question, maybe I'm teaching my kids a little too much about superheroes. And I had to explain to them that they were not real. So then I finish that and I go to bed. I lay down again, close my eyes. And shortly, in, in, in no time at all again, Dad, Dad, Daddy, Dad, Dad, Daddy, Dad. And so I go back in the room, and we've got another problem, right? Now he's too bored. He can't sleep. I need to put his music on for him now at this point. (laughs) And so this this is what goes on. And if you're a parent, you've probably had many a sleepless night where your kids are calling out to you. You're crying out to you. And this is what's happening in this psalm. This is a beautiful picture of a son calling out to his dad because he doesn't know what's going on. That's what David's doing in this psalm. Do you know it's totally okay for us as people? Despite the fact that we are called to faith, to obey God, to trust in Him, it's okay sometimes to call out to our Father because we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on. All we know is that we're experiencing injustice, that those that we love are experiencing injustice, and we don't understand what's going on. So we cry out to our Father. This is what David says at the beginning, as I've already mentioned. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? He's crying out to the one who has the power to deal with injustice and he knows it. Now there's three ways that we typically tend to respond to injustice in our world and in our culture. The first of those ways is that we sometimes ignore it. Sometimes we see injustice and it's so unbearable, so painful, so complicated And even a challenge to our faith that we choose to see no evil, hear no evil. That we choose to kind of put the blinders on, the earmuffs on, and hope that we can continue with our lives. 
And we think of the evil and the injustice as something that happens over there or far away. We look at other nations and the injustice that they go through and the pain that they feel. And we kind of focus on our own life. And I don't really blame us for many of us for doing that. And I, I do it myself. And the reason we do it is because we want to try and continue in our life as best as possible. And if we truly looked at injustice in our world, it would slow us down. Because it is unbearable. Because it's overwhelming. And this is actually the second way that some of us deal with it. We look at the unbearableness of it, the overwhelming nature of it, and we shut down. We say, I can never do anything about that. Human trafficking is so horrific, so unimaginable. How could someone like me ever do anything about something that evil and so complicated that spans the entire world? A trade of millions of people. How could I ever do anything about that? And so we shut down in hopelessness. And then the last way is a beautiful way. We try and confront it. We try and do something about it. We face it. We get involved with organizations that fight injustice and fight for those who are afflicted. But on many times, we try and do that in our own strength, in our own wisdom. And we forget that there is a God that cares deeply about injustice. There is a God who in the face of great injustice has not forgotten the afflicted, and neither should we. All three of these ways of dealing with injustice, I think, are not biblical. They're not the best way to deal with it. The true biblical response to injustice is to let our souls cry out to our Father in the midst of not understanding, not feeling able, and saying, Father, where are you? Father, we need you. Injustice is not hopeless, even though it exists and is a great challenge. We have a God who is with us, leading us, and granting us gifts to be able to confront it. That's the call on every Christian life. And that's why David cried out. And I think David does also a couple of things in helping us understand injustice better. He kind of defines for us some of the elements of what injustice really is in this psalm. As we go through Psalm 10, it gives us a biblical idea of what injustice is at its core and a better way to understand both those who perpetrate injustice and those who suffer from injustice. I think that the biblical picture he gives us of injustice is this, is that injustice at its, at its core, in all its forms, is really this, a departure from God's rule and reign. A departure from God's rule and reign. In Psalm 9, at the beginning of these two psalms that we've mentioned are linked, in Psalm 9, verse 16, David writes, The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. See, Psalm 9 is telling us that God has executed judgment. He is just. That God is the standard and the pattern of justice from which everything else is understood as just or unjust. And injustice comes when we leave God's intended created order. Injustice fills the void that's left when we decide to remove God. It's a natural happening. Oppression, slavery, discrimination, exploitation are all symptoms of an absence of God's rule and reign. Because God is just and good. And only in the absence of his rule and reign, only when someone else has been put in charge, do those things come in, namely human beings. And so David tells us about the perpetrators of injustice. He tells us about the wicked. This is what he says in Psalm 10, verses 3 and 4. The wicked boast of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. David is telling us about the wicked, these who oppress and exploit and wound others, and tells us that in their heart, they say there is no God. He tells us that they seek for themselves and not for others, not for God. The wicked, those who choose to forsake God's rule and reign, they do it because they are seeking their own desires their own glory, their own fame, their own benefit. 
And the pursuit of their desires leads them to do one particularly horrific thing, which is use others for their own benefit. Injustice is when those who have departed God's rule and reign choose to use others as a means for gain for themselves. So they exploit them. They oppress them. This is what else we're told in verses 9 and 10. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. See, the wicked are exploiting and oppressing so that they might gain, so that they might rule and reign instead of God. And this is something that's not exclusive to these great crimes that we see in the world. Injustice begins in very small ways in all of our own hearts, in the ways that we choose to say we don't want God's rule and reign. All of self-serving relationships, whether they're on the scale of human trafficking or whether they're on the scale of simply being cruel to one another here in Geneva, Illinois, all self-serving relationships are the opposite of what God's intention is. And so they're unjust. And the afflicted are those that suffer this most. Here's how I think of the afflicted. The afflicted are those from whom the rule and reign of God is obscured. They can't see it. Because someone has chosen to step in between and exploit them, oppress them. And they're no longer seeing God's justice, his goodness, because human beings have got in the way. David writes in, in verse 12 of Psalm 10, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand, forget not the afflicted. He prays and he calls out, he cries out to his father, let them see you. Let the afflicted who feel forgotten and abandoned by you, let them be reminded that you rule and reign, that you're just, that you're good. Don't let these others that are exploiting them and impressing them get in the way of them being able to see you, God. More than anything, David wants God to do something so the afflicted will see that he's good, that he's just, that he cares about them, that he loves them. Do you cry out to God like that on the behalf of others? Do you long that those who suffer from injustice might see a God who loves them, cares for them? Are you willing to explore your own heart and say, is there any elements of my own heart, my own life, that bring injustice? Is there anyone at all in my life, whether they be at work or in my family, that I choose to perhaps use for my own gain, for my own benefit, that I might have the things that I desire? And do you live knowing that what this world desperately needs most is an image of the one who is just and good? An image of the one who is in love with us, who defends the fatherless and the widow and the orphan. Because in the face of great injustice, God has not forgotten the afflicted and neither should we. The second thing I think David leads us to do is to cling to faith. You remember learning in school those various uh, math skills that you swear at the time are not going to be useful in any way. Uh, and then you continue to grow up and you really get that justified. You find out, yeah, actually they are useless. Until you start doing a home project. When you start landscaping and you building stuff. I remember uh, very recently, not too long ago, we decided to build some window boxes on our house. And we're putting them together. And in my mind, I'm not a carpenter, I don't know anything about this. I thought it's as simple as putting some wood together, putting some nails in and sticking it on there somehow. But the truth is, I find out that all this math that I used to do as a kid, trig trigonometry and all these angle calculating and everything like that, was actually a very useful skill to have, right? That it was for this moment. I remember finally realizing this is it. This is the moment I prepared for as a seven-year-old boy. Right now, I'm going to make this box perfectly angled to fit on my window. And so I went to work trying to put all that to, to use. Now... Some of us tend to think that our faith is for the good moments, right? That we praise God because everything's going right. And we go to God because he's blessed us immensely. Now, I, 
we absolutely go to God for the good reason. We should go to God because God has blessed us, because he's cared for us, he's provided for us, he's done amazing things for us. But did you know that our faith is also for the moments where he seems furthest away? This is why we have this book. It is why we have this psalm. David has given his honest words to God about injustice to us so that when you and I pick up this book in our worst moments, we have truth to cling to. We have the picture and the image of a God to cling to who loves us, who has not forgotten us. The gospel is for our worst moments as well as our good ones. This is what David writes in Psalm 10, verses 16 and 18. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and to the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. David begins reciting what he knows to be true about God. This is who you are. And I think that when we see injustice in our world, we should cling to two truths of our faith. First of all, the character of God. That we know God is good, that he is king forever, that he does rule and reign. And second of all, what he has done, that he has throughout human history acted on behalf of the oppressed. When I think about a woman who knows what it means to cling to their faith, I think of a woman called Corrie Ten Boom. I'm sure many of you have heard of. She's the author of something called The Hiding Place and a survivor of a Holocaust camp in World War II, concentration camp. And during the war, she and her family decided to stand for the oppressed by hiding and caring for uh, Jewish families that were being hunted by the Nazi party. Eventually, they were caught and taken to a concentration camp. And there, Corrie Ten Boom faced circumstances that caused her to cling to her faith. She saw incredible darkness. But she also said that in darkness, God's truth shines most clear. And we've got a picture of Corey here when she's saying that. She said in darkness, God's truth shines most clear. She believed that her faith in God was precisely for this moment. This moment in which she faced horrible injustice. In which she saw others facing horrible injustice. So she clung to the character of the one she knew was just, was good. She understood what the prophet Jeremiah said when Jeremiah says in chapter 9, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth for in these things i delight declares the lord that's who our god is and in fact throughout the old testament god actually accuses those who seem to do many many things in their faith but forget who he is if you want to see god it is most frustrated and disappointed in the old testament It's when his own people forget to care for those who are suffering from injustice. Because when they do that, they demonstrate that they've forgotten who he is. If we do not care for those who are in need, and we boast in everything else, then we've forgotten who our God is. If there's no place in our life to fight against and cry out against injustice, we've forgotten who our God is. Corey understood the purpose of her faith was to shine in the darkness, to be a light in the darkness as Christ was a light for her, as God had been a light for the nation, always. And what we should want as God's people is for him to be seen clearly, to shine in the midst of the worst darkness. And we do that by clinging to our faith, by clinging to the truth of who he is. The last thing that David points us towards doing is continuing to work. Continuing to work. Here's what he says in Psalm 10, verse 15. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. It's kind of a gruesome way of talking. It pops up every now and then. And sometimes we don't really know what to do with verses like this. Does this mean we have to go out and find the most unjust person we can and break their arm? 
of course not. Here's what it means in the Old Testament. When God's using phrases like this, it's less about actually going out and doing the literal breaking of an arm. It's about breaking the power, right? That was a, a phrase, a way of saying, break the power of the wicked people, God. End it so the injustice doesn't keep happening. And how does God break the strength of the wicked? How does he break the strength of the unjust? Through me and you. Through his church, through his people. We are the ones that God has called throughout all of history to stand up against injustice, to care for the orphan and the widow, to stand against slavery, to stand against these things that don't represent who he is and what he's done. We continue to fight against injustice as the church today because in the face of great injustice, God has not forgotten the afflicted and neither should we. Neither should we. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. God has given us victory. He's given us ultimate victory in Christ. If there is one person for whom you can give your life and know that it will absolutely not be done in vain, it is God. Because he holds the future in his hands and he has promised us that there will be a day in which there will be no injustice ever again. And he's called us to work towards that end. Because we know that day, friends, because we know that day, we can work today. We can get involved with ministries around us. We can get involved with those who are afflicted right now because we know that our God holds the victory. Sometimes I wonder how much in my own heart I truly believe that God has given me the victory when I don't get involved, when I choose to stay at home and to put the earmuffs on and to close myself out from injustice. Because if I believe that God has given the victory, don't I want to be on the front lines knowing that I can't lose? God cannot lose. Here's three things that we can do to continue to work with our God. The first is we can get to know the afflicted. We can get to know the afflicted. There's many ministries, even attached to our church, where we can do this. I know it's a bend sometimes because we don't really know people who are afflicted, who suffer from injustice. Some of these big problems out in the world, we don't know anyone going through them. I would argue you come into contact with them a lot more than you realize. Human trafficking is a problem just on Randall Road. Injustice is not very far from us, friends. And there are those that God has called to get to know. There's ways you can do that. If you got involved even in a small group here at church, you are likely to come in contact with someone who's suffering from injustice. You could get involved with ministries like Naomi's House. Naomi's House is an organization that fights for those who are going through trafficking. And I had the pleasure of coming into contact with them simply by saying yes to a serve opportunity to go out and clean up some things and got to meet women who were going through that program. And I remember feeling for the first time in my life, I was meeting the very people that all these stories are here. These are real people. I saw their faces, saw their eyes, saw the things that they were going through. And I realized God wants me to know their stories. He wants me to see these people. And it doesn't matter that I can't end human trafficking in one day. By getting to know the afflicted, I can love them. And I can give them a picture of the God who cares about them. We can pray for the afflicted. Once you get to know someone better, I promise you, you are going to be 100% better at praying for them. When they're no, no longer just some idea out there that we are to fight against, but they are a person whom you know. And when we say pray for them, I mean get on our knees and regularly pray for them. Pray as David prays in this psalm, God, break the power of those who do injustice. In our city, end those who are sowing injustice in our streets. End those who are sowing injustice amongst our youth. 
crying out to our father like a child in the night saying, Daddy, please end this. And lastly, we can partner with those who work for the afflicted. We can serve in ministries. Here, the, just last night in Micah 6, 8, we showcased to be a part of the Juvenile Justice Center, the Illinois Center for Youth, Naomi's House, a new program that's starting here at South Street through our Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry called Administer Justice, where members of our own congregation are loving, serving, giving their time to consult with and help those who are going through legal injustice. Friends, I do want to tell you that we are a very lucky church in that God has afforded us the resources and the opportunities to serve and to love and to give our lives for those who are suffering from injustice. There are so many doorways and opportunities. And if you want to get to know them and you don't know how, come talk to me, talk to Kenton. We would love to help you get involved because there are so many who need your gifts and your voice, and the image of Christ that is in you. We are lucky as a church. And I pray that as a church, that we would be like David, that we would cry out on behalf of the afflicted and say, God, end it. And end it through us. Because we know there is great injustice and we cry out to you. Because we know that there is a God who is able to, to do something about it, and so we cling to our faith. And because we know there is a God who has the victory, and so we continue to work. Would you pray with me against these great injustices as we close this morning? Father, I thank you for your incredible love, and I thank you that in the face of great injustice, you have not forgotten the afflicted, and neither should we. God, you are the God of justice, and the God who sees and the God who moves. And God, I pray that we would cry out to you, we would cling to you. And Lord, I pray as well that we would continue to work by your side, for your glory, in your name. We pray, amen.